Good evening and welcome to another in the series of Get the Facts. I am your host, William Neal. Thank you very much for joining us. And of course, this is in an effort to give you a well-rounded 360 perspective on all matters related to COVID. Tonight, we are going to be talking to some young people as a part of the rollout of vaccinations for our 12 to 17 year olds. But before we do that, I'd just like to remind you that this is a discussion that is a collaboration between the Ministry of Health and Wellness and Channel 5. Of course, it's also interactive in its nature, so we encourage you to submit your questions, whether it's by video, video or just by text, uh, at our live stream on Facebook at News 5 Live, or using hashtag GetTheFacts. Tonight, as per usual, we'll start with a revision of COVID-19 numbers for the week of August 23rd to the 30th which is tonight. And they are as follows. Total tests reported, 10,677. Total positive cases reported, 597. Total deaths, 8. On the flip side, let's take a look at the number of Belizeans vaccinated. Our vaccination data for Monday, August 23rd to August 30, 2021, total vaccinated for the week, 3,526. Total single vaccinated for the week, 818. Total fully vaccinated for the week, 2,708. Our cumulative data, total vaccinated, 156,010. Total fully vaccinated, 68,719. Total vaccination of children, 12 to 17. Total vaccinated, 8,993. Of course, those are our statistics compiled by the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And they lead very nicely into our discussion for tonight. Of course, our Pfizer vaccine is a one shot. So, or two, within a very short period of time, I'm sorry, two. It's actually three? Two within three weeks, okay? So that's why a lot of the young people are getting completely or fully vaccinated within a very short period of time. Now, we are going to be talking in our live discussion tonight the risks of contracting COVID and COVID variants after being vaccinated. Our panel will include students. We have Raven Lizama, who's in studio with me. She's a student at Gwen Lizaraga High School. We have also in studio, we have Sana Roland, who's a student at St. Catherine Academy. And then online joining us, we have Julian Alamia, who's a student at St. John's College. We have Abby Leslie, who's a student at Edward P. York High School. And we have Giselle Alamia, who's a student at St. Catherine Academy. And we have a brother and sister team. So uh, let's start off by welcoming our young panelists. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you You're for welcome. having us. Now, let's start off by just uh, talking a, a little bit about your decision um, to get vaccinated. How did that come about? What was the conversation like with your parents or with your guardians? Sana, let's start with you. Okay, so first of all, the conversation with my parents was pretty clear. I mean, like from when I was younger, vaccinations, we always hear about vaccinations. The sole purpose of a vaccine is to provide your, is to stimulate your um, immune system to fight against whatever virus it's supposed to protect you from. So that's what I 
grew up um I grew up I grew up learning that and that's what guided me to decide that I want to take the vaccine. I wasn't coerced to take the vaccine. I decided on my own to take it because I realized that was the best decision to do and I want to stay protected from this virus. Did your parents have any objections? Did you have to convince them? No, I didn't. My mom was all in. From the very beginning? Yes, she was. All right. Now, uh, Raven, let's talk about you. What was it like for you? Well, the day our teacher told us that we had to take the vaccine so that we could have the face-to-face -face learning, we didn't have any problem with it. I told my mom, and she agreed with it because she told me that you take it from your baby and it just won't help you with whatsoever virus what you have. It will help you fight it off. All right. So it was not a hard decision? No, sir. Okay. Let's talk to uh, Giselle and Julian. Did you two have to gang up on your parents? Uh, no. Our parents are pretty open to us with taking the vaccine. And me and Giselle both wanted to take the vaccine to, you know, to protect ourselves and our family. Yeah, we, we decided from a while ago that we were going to take the vaccine to protect ourselves. So you guys were on a countdown? Yeah, yeah. we were basically on a countdown. Waiting for it. All right, let's bring Abby into the conversation. Um, Abby, night. what was your, good night. What was your um, experience like? My experience physically was straightforward. My parents didn't have to tell me that I needed the vaccine because I wanted to get it to protect myself and others. It was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and let me ask all of you, and any one of you can jump in. Did you all do your, you know, we've been having so many different views on vaccinations. How did you all get to a point where you're comfortable enough to just say, um, without any coercion by parents or school or anyone, to actually make that decision? Okay, so I'll be honest. Last week, that was when I decided that I wanted the vaccine. Before that, I was scared. I was scared because I simply had the wrong sources of information like social media. Social media isn't a credible source to get your information from. So on Instagram, I was seeing videos that, oh, if you take the vaccine, you're going to die. And it's going to give you like a magnetic pull on your arm and sort of stuff like that. So that's what made me, scared to take the va made me scared to take the vaccine. And that was before we heard that um, it would be available for young people. So I wasn't worrying about it because I was like, the vaccine isn't even available for us yet. So I wasn't worrying about it. So when it came to Belize last week or two weeks ago, my mom was like, Sana, you have to take the vaccine because it's the best thing to do. You got it when you were younger. It's not bad for you. And I went to the World Health Organization page, and that's when I changed my source of information, and that's when I convinced myself to take the vaccine because I changed my source of information. All right. Any, any Abby, Julian, Giselle? Any of you guys? Mm, well... I've been wanting to take the vaccine from when I heard that it was available to kids from 12 and over. From when I heard that, I was like, okay, I'm going to take the vaccine because, you know, it gave me just a bit of freedom and my parents would be a bit more lenient with us. Going <laughs> so it was a get out of home card. Yeah, yeah, it was basically <laughs> that too. <laughs> Giselle, your, yours was the same? Do you guys discuss it since you're, the two of you are siblings? Yep. All of us, it's only us left in the family to, because we're the youngest in the family. So from the start, they all put a good influence on us. So it helped our decision to get it. So, well, we decided to get it and it would be better for us because we get to go out more. <laughs> All right. And you, Raven? Well, I had, I had the comfortable spot. I had to take it because the information where I see on the social media, some people say, as you get the vaccine, some people start act funny. Some people drop down, go on like they're critical. 
But I rather prefer take the vaccine because even though if I catch the COVID, I could still have the vaccine would help me fight towards it. So I rather take the vaccine so I could be safe. And Abby? Um, I wanted to take the vaccine because it's a step closer to face-to-face -to -face learning, which is easier for me. Because online is not really that easy, but not really that hard at the same time. Oh yeah. Now, you all, um, what's the conversation among young people? Because I think that's one of the main things. Do you all discuss it? Um, and how do you actually uh, speak to people who may not share your views? Well, for me personally, I respect everyone's perspective because I know I was there once, like I didn't want to take the vaccine at some point. So I just share share with them like the web pages and the websites that I get my that I got my information from, and then they can decide whether they want to take it from there because I don't want to coerce anyone into taking the vaccine and they don't know like the facts. So if they get to know the facts, it will be pretty clear that the vaccine is the best thing to to, to do. Getting it is the best thing to do. So that's my view of it. Any one of you? Yeah, with me it's similar to Sana. Whenever I see one of my friends, I'll ask them if they've already gotten vaccinated or if they're planning to take the vaccine. Um, if they say yes, then I'm going to be like, well, nice job. But if they disagree with me, then I'll send them information about the vaccine and try to like somewhat convince them to get it because, you know, it's the safest thing for them. Where did you, Sana said that her main uh, credible source that shifted her perspective was the WHO uh, site. What did you go to in terms of getting sound, reliable um, information? I went to the same WHO website. Giselle? I saw a lot online because, again, social media really makes a difference for a lot of people. You see bad things, you see good things. The vaccine, I saw a lot of people posting, you know, those conspiracy theories. I don't believe in them, but they have a right to their opinion. And if my friends would say that they got their vaccine, I would be, you know, like, good job also. <laughs> it's better. You're safer. All right. And... Uh... Abby, what was the conversation like with you among your friends? Well, among me and my friends, not, not really everyone disagreed because we all got vaccinated because it's the best thing for us. And we all just want to be safer from the coronavirus. Now, you know, when you look at the wider society and the conversations that are happening, especially on social media, what's your reaction as young people to some of the things that adults are saying? Well, my reaction towards the comments from adults is very... Well, my, my main reaction is disappointment, you know, because if I'm, I'm 16 years old, if I can understand that this is the best thing to do, why can't the older generation understand that as well? So I don't blame them, but I just feel that if I'm able to understand that it's good for me, they are able to understand that it's good for them as well. So that's just my view on and that. And you said something critical as well. You did research on your own as opposed yes, to just listening to what was being said on social media. Yes, How important is that, you think? And what would you say to adults in that regard? Well, to adults, I would tell them to do their own research. Do your own research mm -hmm. and not listen to what people are saying. Don't listen to the rumors. Don't listen to those theories like what Giselle mentioned, because at the end of the day, the facts are there. They're stated on the sites. You can go to WHO site and you will see those facts. If you don't like reading, you can call a doctor, call your family doctor and ask them about it and they will give you the facts. Just don't listen to the rumors. Because at the end of the day, I listened to the rumors once and I was wrong. So you can correct those 
those thoughts in your head, if you think that the vaccine will kill you or sicken you or any of those things, you can correct them. Anybody else with regards to that question? Um, I, it's crazy because a lot of adults are, they're supposed to give us a good influence. You know, they're supposed to, they're also supposed to inform us. We, we look up to them for guidance, but some don't inform themselves, as Sanal said. So it's, it's best if we do it ourselves. Okay. Anybody else has a comment? You don't all have to, but. Um, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, you go. Um, I was walking on the street and I heard when a woman told her child that she's not going to allow her to take the vaccine because once she takes the vaccine, her head is going to get big and she's going to die. But then it's like end of the day, she's not giving her child the support that she actually needs. She needs to encourage her child the good way that she would actually take the vaccine because I see some of the kids, they are afraid. And some of the parents, they are not influencing their child to go and take the vaccine. The vaccine is the best way so that we could go back to school and have a better life. Julian, thank you. Rachel. Yeah, as I was going to say from before, I feel like adults are also influenced like children are by social media. And I would honestly recommend for them to do their research before, as Sana said, I'm going to the WHO website it is perfect for that. Now, there's been a lot of concern with regards to how quickly the vaccinations were developed. Did you all do a research on that? Or do you understand, any of you, how vaccines actually work? And was that a concern of how quickly um, the vaccinations were developed? Because that seems to be one of the major concerns from people that you speak to outside um, who are gathering information, whether from uh, good or not so good sources? Well, for me, um, I didn't really research it to clarify how long it took to create these vaccines. But from what I heard on social media, they were like, oh, it was made in less than a year. So that simply means that it's not good because other vaccines take a longer period of time to be created. But what I realized is that the same people that create the vaccines in that long period of time are the same, same ones that create it in a shorter period of time. And we just have to put our trust in them because that, that is their job. That is what they, they learn to do and they're trained to do that. So we just have to trust them that they made the vaccine and it's going to work for us. And it, it, the facts are there. It has worked for many people. Yes, there are always risks and there will always be risks. So like one of 1,000 persons might die. And that's because they might have an underlying condition, but people don't understand this. People just say that, oh, one person dead, so I not take it because I could be the one person. So it's just the way that you look at things, guys. It's just your perspective. Okay. Anybody else with regards to that? If not, I'll switch to another question. Now, school was scheduled to be reopened for face-to-face -face learning. Let's talk a little bit about you all as young people. Uh, so now you're in fourth form. Raven, what form are you in? Fourth form. Fourth form as well. Julian and Giselle? I'm in fourth and she's in second. Um, second. second. And Abby, what form are you in? Fourth. Okay, so for you all, the last almost two years has been uh, online learning. What do you think uh, or how has that impacted your high school experience? Well, to be honest, I don't like the online classes, none at all, because some of it, that like, first, it will be difficult, you know, hard, but it, it easy, but you know, hard. And that, like, we don't get the chance to go to our real high school experience like what other kids end up to get, because this is our last lap. And we not end up to experience a prom or a good graduation or things like those. But we just have to satisfy what we get because at the end of the day, we don't know what all could happen. But to be honest, yes, you might not get all of those, but you have to guard at least. We still safe and we not get no corona or nothing like that. 
Anybody else? So to add to what Raven said, I completely agree with her. And for my school, I think we're scheduled to open in October. And that's if everything goes well, because at this point, anything can change at any time. But I, for my high school experience, I'm really sad that I had to spend my first year as a science major online and probably my last year as a science major online. So that's just a very sad feeling because I always expected high school to be four years at SCA on campus. And being in my home just makes me feel like I'm not at school sometimes. And that's a disadvantage because that is when you become very relaxed. When I was in the classroom, I, was, I knew that, OK, I'm here in the classroom. It's time to work. When I go home, it's time to relax and do some homework. But now you're at home, and you really have to stay focused because if you slip, and that's, your grades can get hurt by that slip that you um, do. So that's just what I don't like about it because when last year in third form when I started um, science I had a really difficult time personally um, at the beginning of the semester my grades weren't they weren't fail failing grades because I'm a straight A student but my grades weren't as I expected them to be and that was a disappointment because I expected to be in class and for the teachers to be going around and making sure that we understand because online you're in front of a screen the teachers can't see you because the bandwidth is damaged if your cameras are on so the teachers can't see you and some people are shy to raise their hand and say sir I don't understand because they're ashamed when you're in class, the teacher will go around, they can see us and they can see if you can't understand something and be like, okay, Sana, I know you're not understanding this. Let me talk to you about it. But many people don't have the, the gut to say in class, sir, I'm not understanding it. Can you please explain it? And that's the problem right there. Okay. Abby, Giselle, and Julian, any thoughts there? So um, add me. Oh, sorry, you go. <laughs> sorry. To add to that, um, I also agree that we're missing out on our high school experience because the stuff that we can't do, like sports days, assemblies, and other functions during the year that are different from just our school work. And I had at least one or two sports days in my high school experience, which I was looking forward to more, but this virus came and we had to stay home. Julian? Yeah, with me, I think we've somewhat been deprived of our high school experience, but it also has been the safest thing for us. I've also grown accustomed to online learning, and I'm not sure how I'd feel if we were to go back into the classroom because I'm used to, I already used to waking up, and going behind my desk, getting ready for school and everything, typing out my notes, and I'm not sure if when we go back to the classroom, they allow us to have our laptops because I have all my notes on my laptop and I've already gotten used to it, so. So yeah. you, you want uh, computers when, if you return, or when you return, you want computers in the classroom to facilitate yeah. your learning? Yeah, because I've already grown very accustomed to using them. Giselle? I haven't, I feel like I haven't really had a full, a high school experience yet because I'm only in second form. So I basically didn't have an orientation, face to face, a tour around school, nothing like that. And I, it upset me for a while, but I've grown, I've adjusted, I've adjusted really good to online school. And there's so far, there's been 50% of the SEA students vaccinated. And I hope it'll go up because the, I hope more girls inform themselves and they can get vaccinated because I would like to go to school in October. I hope it'll happen so I could finally get a little experience. Okay, thank you, Giselle. And we're getting ready to wrap this segment. I want to thank you all for taking the time to be with me tonight. And uh, just final words, anything that you'd like to say to anyone uh, who is within the range of 12 to 17 um, with regards to vaccinations? I'd like to say to young people that um, I know many of you may not be 
able to like make your own decisions so even if your parents are stubborn and they don't want to know the facts you can show them the facts because us as children we can teach our parents things so if your parent doesn't want to know the facts and allow you to take the vaccine maybe you can convince them because just like how your parents can convince you you can convince them so I'm just leaving that I'm going to leave that with you guys and tell you to convince your parents read up about the vaccine know the facts and hopefully you choose the best possible option, which is to get vaccinated. Raven? Well, I just want you guys to see is that you guys just have to be positive because you have really negative people out here that will tell you that of false information. You just got to stay positive and you make your own choice. You don't, it's not by force or you could take advice by someone, but you got to go with your own choice. Okay, thank you very much. And Giselle and Julian? I'd honestly want to tell everyone to not take anything seriously that you see on social media because it does have a lot of negative things on it and I'd recommend everyone to do their research beforehand because at the end of the day taking the vaccine is the safest thing for you and your family. Thank you Julian. Giselle? I'd say again inform yourself and don't let your friends influence your decision because a lot of people whatever their friends do they'll do and it goes a lot that's really common but Inform yourself, do it for yourself because you're not protecting their, you're not, it's their own decision. You're protecting yourself. Thank you, Giselle. And Abby, to wrap it up. I agree with Giselle that we should educate ourselves and don't follow the company because at the end of the day, it's for your benefit. And by taking the vaccine, you can not only benefit them for being safe from you, you can be see from them if they acquire the virus. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for sitting down again and being a part of our conversation. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, it will be to be joined by Dr. Laura Friesen, General Physician at the BMA NHI Clinic. Don't go anywhere. Get the facts returned after these messages. Why should you wear your mask? To protect myself. My friends. My family and others. I wear my mask because I love my grandparents. With so many reasons to wear a mask, we continue to advise persons to wear a face mask properly, covering both nose and mouth. Together, we can keep Belize COVID-19 safe. At Belize Diagnostic Center, we offer FDA-approved PCR testing for COVID-19. Get your results as quickly as one hour. Don't risk getting exposed to COVID-19 by going elsewhere. We take appointments or we can come to your home or office using our concierge service with no additional fees. We have 10 locations countrywide. Call or WhatsApp us at 613-TEST. That is 613-8378 to schedule your test today. With the rise in COVID cases and youths being infected, it is time to be safe and stay safe with SAFE, Sanitization and Fumigation of Environments. Let our professionally trained and certified team be your solution to a clean, healthier, and safe environment for your home or business. For more information, call our WhatsApp 613-0222 or visit us at 2.5 miles Philip Golson Highway beside Friendship Restaurant. 
Choose the one you can trust. Choose safe. Save, save, save. The credit union way. Member save, owners save, are encouraged save, to save regularly, borrow wisely, and repay save, promptly. No use keeping the money in your pocket. Soon as you turn wrong, you know you ain't got it. So as money goes from hand to hand, give your cash to the umbrella man and tell him you save, save, save. The credit union way. Save, save, save. It will make you rich someday. As Belize continues to shield its people from the worst ravages of this pandemic, we must continue to keep our country safe by ensuring reliable supply chains for critical components for the fight ahead. Belize's oxygen supply is safe with 300% more oxygen supply in country than is necessary. However, Fabregas continues to make our oxygen supply chain even more robust and responsive to a potential worst-case scenario. Through supply arrangements established and secured by Fabregas, our country can receive critical life-saving oxygen from five regional neighbors in Mexico and Central America through marine and or land transportation. So, in addition, Fabregas has secured additional reliable sources of life-saving oxygen using a diversity of transportation modes and countries of origin. Fabregas, Belize Limited. We got your back. And welcome back to Get the Facts. I am your host, William Neal. And as promised before the break, we have been joined in studio by Dr. Laura Friesen. Good night and welcome to the show. Good night. It's nice to be here today. Thank you very much for taking time out. I know it must be hectic. Yes, it's, I don't think it's been this bad in South Side of Blee City since the pandemic started. So we're quite busy. What... Uh, type of patients are you seeing? Let's use that as a segue into our conversation. Even though we're going to be talking about care mm -hmm. uh, at home, home care, mm -hmm. let's talk about what are the, the uh, illnesses that people are coming um, to the uh, clinic for and how has Im um, COVID impacted what you can deliver? So, um, and as far as illnesses uh, and as far as our clinical um, cases, we have had asymptomatic cases, we've had mildly symptomatic cases, and we've had severe cases coming into the clinic. Um, we normally see a wide range of uh, you know, primary care cases. We see um, acute um, illnesses, we, we deal with hypertensive, um, diabetes, and all these kinds of situations. And so definitely when we have our older patients coming in with comorbidities of this kind and um, infected with COVID, that makes it complicated and we have had to really work with some of our patients to try to make sure that they're okay. What kind of uh, triaging happens there in terms of deciding how you're going to handle some people who may just need, you know, the regular care for like a comorbidity? So we provide regular care and we have an acute clinic where we would see anybody with any kind of acute, uh, possibly infectious symptoms. So these include we have fever, cough, uh, runny nose, sore throat, um, abdominal pain, headaches, fatigue. Um, so we kind of triage them at the door. And then if we suspect any kind of infectious um, symptom, we would um, see them in a separate section of the clinic um, where we have a little bit more safety protocols in place. And then if the patients have no risk factors and have no symptoms of infectious disease, then we would see them in um, our main clinic where um, we would see them as we normally do even from before the pandemic. Of course, with our safety gear as much as possible. So how do you manage people who are asymptomatic? Because I think that would be the tricky um, area who are coming in and are not exhibiting anything but maybe headaches, etc. So the asymptomatic people, there, there's no way to know if they are infected unless they do a test. And so that, that depends on the general level of infection in the, in the society, in, the, in our people. So that is not something that we can really control very well, except through contact tracing, which is done through Ministry of Health and not directly through our clinic. 
So we don't necessarily manage them per se. Um, we just try to take our universal precautions everywhere and then take special precautions with patients that we do have high suspicions of being infectious. Now, let's shift a little bit to talk about people who are nursing mild symptoms or something related to COVID at home. What's the best way to deal with it, especially given the Delta variant? So my first, um, my first advice here is that the best thing is always to get an, an initial evaluation by a doctor. Um, get your swab done, get your diagnosis, um, get your medication that you need, your prescriptions for whatever different medications are used to treat symptoms. Remember that there's not a specific cure for COVID, so we kind of manage the symptoms and make sure that we're not, you know, decompensating um, at home. And so that's always the first thing. Get a diagnosis, get a swab, get, get, you know, get seen so that we know what we're starting out with. And from there we can, you know, see and manage and see if you get better, which would be a, is a mildly symptomatic case. And in some cases, you would also start to feel worse. Now with cases that are um, patients that have comorbidities, it's especially important to get an initial diagnosis because the blood pressure, people with problems with blood pressure and diabetes, they need to take special care um, as they are getting sick to make sure that their comorbidities are controlled because the less controlled their comorbidities are, the more risk of decompensation they will have at home. So that's why I say initial contact is always for me. I tell people, get a diagnosis, see a doctor. And then from there, we can give advice and prescriptions on how to manage at home. And there's several different things that we can discuss about management at home including um, hydration and rest and nutrition and anxiety management. You know, these are different things that we can address um, about home care. Let's start with the anxiety because I think that's where it starts. I go, I take a test. I don't have an idea whether I am positive or negative. Mm -hmm. How do I manage that? The weight in itself is something, you know, uh, quite difficult for you to, to manage. Well, there is a, a, a something that we, a phenomena that we see a lot in medicine. Um, a lot of times we prefer not to know than to know something that might be bad news. And I um, always uh, try to, um, to advise people that it's better to know as soon as possible because then we can treat and prevent complications. And so we have to get over this fear of, oh, I don't want to know about COVID because then, then for sure I will feel like I'm dead. No, know what it is so that you know what, so that we know what we're treating as doctors and that so you know how to take care of yourself at home, right? So it's, it's, it's about t coming away from the mentality of I don't want to have bad news. Know what's happening, know the facts, you know. Don't be okay with subjectivity or just I feel like I have COVID or I feel like I don't have. You know, get, see what we're dealing with. See a doctor, get a swab, do some tests if you need them and so that we know what we're dealing with. That's part of the anxiety management. The other thing is don't cross a bridge until you get there. Don't feel like, oh, I'm going to end up in the hospital, I'm going to die just because my swab was positive. No, you can do a lot to help yourself. You can help prevent complications. You can, you can do things. You can make sure you monitor yourself. Um, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a set conclusion. There's a many things in between, and so you don't, you don't cross a bridge before you come to it. You know, you take one day at a time. You relax, you breathe deeply, you listen to calming music, you meditate, pray, whatever you need to do, and open your windows and let the breeze in. And you, you know, it, it's one day at a time with COVID. For some people, it can be a very long stretch. It can be a long recovery period. Um, and so during that time, it's important to also be patient with yourself, patient with how your symptoms are behaving realizing that COVID is a hard disease for some people. And if you're one of those, you have to be patient with yourself to let your body recover. And that's a very important part of, of the whole anxiety management as well. Now, so we've gotten the test, we have the anxiety and we're managing that. What do you do in the meantime? How do you, especially with the Delta variant, how do you isolate in your home? Okay. 
that, that, that's very important to realize the necessity of doing that because um, you are actually infectious um, up to two to three days before you actually exhibit any symptoms and then during your first 10 to 14 days after starting symptoms. And so whenever you have any flu-like symptoms or fever or your test comes back positive, it's important to isolate at home as much as possible. So if you have a house where you have separate bedrooms for persons, then the person that is sick or has done a swab needs to go and stay in one separate bedroom. If there is separate bathrooms, then assign one bathroom for the sick person. If that is not possible, then the bathroom should be sanitized after every use by the sick person. And if the bedroom situation is not possible, the second option would be to um, separate the beds as far as possible and maybe put a curtain in between so that you kind of have a boundary. And so these are just things that you can do at home. You can also make sure that the ventilation is good. I know in Belize, we are so scared of the draft, but you know, breeze is good, air is good. We need oxygen, we need fresh air to come in and out of the house. The more fresh air is coming in and out of the house, um, the less um, viral particles will remain in the air and to infect other people. The sick person should also wear a mask if he needs to step out of the room that they're staying in. Um, to protect the family members as well. And it's always a good idea to assign one family member to help take care of the sick person and not expose everybody to this illness because you could have several family members sick at once. And we've had um, cases like that in, in our clinic where we have a whole household that's, that's feeling ill at the same time. And, and that's kind of hard for everybody involved, right? And so that, that's a way to kind of you know, help protect people in your household. How do you decide if you're going to have a body system for the person who's sick, how do you decide who would be the best person within your home to actually uh, team up and give the all clear when they're... You mean to help take care of you yeah. if you're sick? Well, preferably it would be somebody without comorbidities, someone who's not elderly, um, so somebody that's not diabetic or asthmatic or hypertensive or, or obese, and someone that is... Um, that is able to take care of you, has the physical capacity to make you tea and to bring you food, right? So that, that kind of, um, it's important to kind of try to see if there's someone that would not be putting themselves at risk too much. But even with that person, if there's, you know, proper mask wearing and distancing, they can still remain relatively and safe. And plenty sanitizing. How? And plenty sanitizing. And plenty sanitizing and disinfecting surfaces. They can still remain somewhat safe, but there is a higher risk of, of, of infection in, in that situation. Now, I know in some of the cases, people were talking about, um, you know, monitoring oxygen levels, etc. Obviously, if you're not a trained medical person, you wouldn't be able to um, monitor your oxygen level. So, at which point, what are some of the signs that you'd have to look for to say, listen, I need to go to a hospital and I need to go now? Okay, so let me just address something that you mentioned with the oxygen monitoring. Um, if there are resources in the household, I actually, especially if there are elderly persons or persons with comorbidities, I would actually encourage people to buy a thermometer and a pulse oximeter. Uh, thermometer uh -huh. to measure temperature and a pulse oximeter, which is the little clip-on thing that you put on the finger, okay? And so if you go to a doctor, they can orient you a little bit further on exactly the usage, but in general, the oxygenation levels, we want them to stay over 94. And so if you have an elderly patient at home that you are taking care of, or you are an elderly patient or someone with comorbidities that has COVID, um, you, if you have the resources to get those, they are, they are good things to have at home to help monitor um, because sometimes that helps also us from, from the doctors when we get a call, someone says, you know, they're having problem with oxygen, you know, or we can't breathe. You know, putting on that pulse ox and even just showing me a video of it already tells me a lot of information. And so there, there are things, and it depends on your resource level. What, what are you able to do? If you're not able to do it, then there are signs. Um, we call them warning signs that you need to look out for mm -hmm. if you are at home. Um, one of them is um, uh, persistent diarrhea and vomiting, 
um, so you're not keeping any fluid or any um, or any uh, food down. Um, the other one is feeling uh, chest pain that doesn't ease up or uh, feeling short of breath where you cannot speak more than several words without taking a breath in between. Another way to find out if you're short of breath also is if just getting up and walking two steps already makes you feel like, like you have to stop and take a breath because that's not normal. A normal person, I can get up from this chair, you know, do 50 walks around this room and I wouldn't feel short of breath. So those are, those are signs that there are problems with oxygenation. Um, severe headache that's not easing up, um, very high fevers that are not easing up. Um, persistent coughing that's leaving you um, feeling uh, like feeling very uh, like a lot of chest tightness or also look, looking blue in the face, um, loss of consciousness, fainting. These are warning signs that you need to seek medical attention and see if further care is needed beyond what you're getting in the home. So these are things that you can monitor at home. Um, even if you don't have a pulse oximeter or a thermometer, you can, you can monitor these things for yourself at home or for your loved one to kind of figure out how well they're doing at home. Now, when uh, we first started talking about COVID itself, people were pushing, for example, to when you come home, take off all your clothes. Uh, especially if you're a person who works and interacts with a lot of people, right? How, and we're talking also about COVID fatigue, with just all the, the, the necessary guidelines, etc. How do you get people to, to understand that those things may actually be an important uh, factor, even though you're tired of them, if you work in a frontline kind of situation? that you should maintain, especially given the Delta variant? I think it's human nature to always kind of slack off after a while. And so um, it, it's important for, um, for you to keep uh, abreast of what's happening in the country. Um, if you realize cases are going up or you see that in your community you know of 20 people that are sick, then you got to tighten. You got to tighten your, your, you know, your, your circle. You got you to gotta do more um, protocols, you got to go back to more strict hand washing, more strict mask wearing. So it, you, you have to be aware of what's happening in your surroundings. Let's say the whole country of Belize didn't have a new COVID case for a month. I think even frontliners would start to slack off a little bit, right? Um, so my point is we need to look at what's happening around us to make good decisions. And so it's always good for us to keep, uh, be aware of what's happening because that helps us to also stay aware of what we are doing to help um, prevent getting infected. And so um, still for anyone who works in a hospital setting um, or in a clinic setting, I would say as you get home, take a shower. I mean, it should have always been like that, but now with COVID, <laughs> we kind of, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of realizing more and more the, the benefits of good hygiene and the benefits of not carrying home bacteria and viruses from, from our workplace into our home, because that's a whole other ball game of, 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 um, of microorganisms that we're talking about there. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Friesen, for joining me for this first segment. What we're going to do right now, as I had said at the top of the show, this is an interactive discussion. So we encourage you to submit your questions or go to our live screen and post your question with the hashtag GetTheFacts. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and when we return, it will be our question and answer period with Dr. Friesen. Get the facts continues after these messages. I believe we don't want to have that sign up there in the channel, Paul. That's not in your channel, yeah, that's not in Spanish. You understand what it said then? Yeah, it said wear your face mask properly, cover your nose and your mouth. Well, help prevent the spread of COVID to others. Together we could make Belize safe. Wear your mask properly over your mouth and nose to protect yourself and others. Together we can keep Belize COVID-19 safe. Looking 
Mom. Hey guys, I'm off to run some errands. Please tidy up this place. <gasps> no! You guys do it. We got cleaners. Cleaners? You know it, that? Cleaner. It works. convenient and flavorful way to give your immune system a daily boost of vitamin C. Just pop the cap, drop it in water, let it fizz and enjoy. And welcome back to Get the Facts and we're now moving into our question and answer segment. And of course, we still have Dr. Friesen here uh, to respond to the questions that we have from our viewing audience. Let's jump directly into our first question. Our first question is, what are some medications you can take at home? Okay, um, this is a very important question because it ties into what I had initially said about get a diagnosis and get a checkup first. Um, and once you have done that, um, there are a lot of different home remedies that you can do and, and different medication you can do to actually manage your symptoms. When you say home re remedies, immediately my mind goes to Vervine <laughs> because everybody was walking around like a miracle. Is it? I would stick with the traditional ones, you know, ginger tea and honey and lime and, you know, vitamin C, you know, those are the ones that I would encourage because sometimes we have people starting to drink all kinds of new teas and they might not know how their body reacts to them. So stick with something that you are familiar with, chamomile, mint, you know, ginger. Um, but as far as medications, um, you know, Tylenol and ibuprofen for fever. Um, there's cough syrups that you can take to control the cough. Honey and lime is also very good for sore throat and cough. Um, so there's different medications. Vitamin C and zinc are, are um, vitamins that are important for respiratory infections. Um, anything more such as antibiotics or steroids should be prescribed by a physician first to avoid any side effects and to make sure that they are actually indicated for the person. And so there are, uh, those are the medications that would be safe to use at home without necessarily having a, a prescription. All right, let's jump into our next question. And it reads, are there any specific foods that you can or cannot eat? There's not really a, a rule over any specific foods that you should not be eating. However... Fried chicken! However, <laughs> I was just going there. Um, for some reason in Belize, we tend to have poor nutritional habits. And this is a problem when we get sick. And then worse yet, we have this idea that we want to starve the fever. That doesn't work if you have fever for seven days, can you starve yourself too? So what we need to do is we need to focus on eating healthy foods. So, um, for example, when you are feeling sick, your body um, has a certain level of energy um, that it, it 
your metabolism uses up a certain amount of energy and then when you get sick you need extra energy to recover and so if you're not eating where will your body get this energy from and so we need nutritious foods for example soups are very good um, stews beans um, for example, like stuff like rice lab, like that are easy to drink, or porridge that you could make thin and like kind of just drink it. If you're having a hard time with solid foods, we should try to stay away from canned foods. We try to stay away from greasy foods. Um, we should try to stay away from any processed foods because they do not provide our body with the nutrition that it needs to actually recover. And so we should try to focus on the vegetables. We try to focus on nutritious foods. We always need to make sure we have protein in our diet when we're sick because why our body uses protein to repair tissues. And so if we're not having any protein in our diet, then we cannot repair our tissues. All right. No fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> what natural remedies can I take for COVID? So there's not a specific natural remedy that will be a cure. How natural remedies work is that they provide a sort of um, a way for your body, like holistically speaking, natural remedies help your body to recover. And so there's not a specific natural remedy, for example, that will kill the virus. I know there has been some things out on the media about, oh, this specific plant will just kill all the virus. As far as I know, those studies have not been done, so I cannot say yes or no on that, but I would not advise for you to rely on that sort of natural remedies. However, there's a lot of remedies that you can do, and I mentioned some already for the symptom treatment. For example, making sure that you're well hydrated, drinking coconut water, um, Pedialyte, warm teas, they help to decongest your respiratory tract. Um, they help you to bring up cold, they help to control the cough, honey and lime helps for sore throat. Um, ginger tea is excellent to bring up cold. So there's a lot of things that we can do at home to help our body recover better um, as, as, as our body is trying to fight this virus. And so that's basically how natural remedies work. It's not a specific cure, but there's are things that you can use to support your body in the healing process. All right, next question. The next question reads as follows. Do you have to wear PPEs to attend to a relative at home who has COVID? It is advisable if, um, if the relative is not too sick that both the relative and the caretaker uh, wear a mask, uh, at least like a medical mask like this, while they're in the same room together, um, just to avoid that, that contact. Now, if they both have COVID or one has already recovered from COVID, then there's not really much point to it. But if one has not had COVID and the other one has, is having symptoms right now, or you don't, do not know if you've had COVID, then it's important to at least be wearing a mask um, to protect yourself from Quick question the there. Some people think gloves. What's your recommendation with gloves? I would say for non-medical personnel, I stick to uh, very good hand washing techniques. Uh, constant hand washing and wiping surfaces like the doorknobs frequently. I think those are more, those are safer and um, you don't, if you're not a medical personnel, sometimes you rely on gloves and you feel safe just because you're wearing the gloves and you don't realize and you take the glove right to your nose and you pick your nose. So those are the kind of things that as a medical personnel, we have learned how to not touch, you know, personal space with our gloves. But if you're not used to wearing gloves, I think it can actually be a source of contagion. And so frequent hand washing with soap and water is actually the better idea um, rather than wearing gloves. All right. We have two more questions. Uh, the next one is, I see they're giving ivermectin now when diagnosed at the clinic. What's the right dosage to take, to take? Some say one every 12 hours, some say three for two days. How does it work? So with this medication, it's a little bit tricky because the studies aren't very conclusive on to, as to the benefits of it just yet. Um, it's being used in some places. We're using it some in Belize. Uh, I, I do suggest that you follow the prescription of your doctor in taking the medication. I do not feel comfortable giving a dosage here when they would be different based on every patient. All right. Next question reads as follows. I thought about this one as well. Your advice for using fans. So like I mentioned before, it's always a good idea to keep the windows open because you're letting fresh air out and you're ventilating the room. 
And as far as fans, there's not a yay or nay on this. It's not clear cut in any way. However, if you do have a dry hacking cough and the fan could irritate it and it could dry out your mucous membranes, especially at night. So I would advise the fan to not blow directly on you, but rather if you wanted to ventilate the room, that would be a better idea just because of the drying out mechanism that it would have on your throat and on your, um, on your mouth. And what about the fear that, you know, it's circulating more of, you know, the particles well, hopefully the downstream fan, or anything like that? Well, hopefully the fan would be in conjunction with open windows and the doorway should be closed. So this should be somewhat of a concealed space. Okay. Right. Final question before we go to break. Why is it necessary for me to isolate among my family members? Well, because if your family members have not had COVID-19, then isolating yourself from them can help save them or protect them so that they don't need to get sick when you're getting sick. So like I had mentioned before, um, even if your family member does end up being sick later, it is very difficult when the whole household is sick at the same time. And so if you have if, you know, four or five members that are with fever and cough and cold, there's nobody who's going to you know, cook and, and prepare the, 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 the fluids and, and to help, right? And so it's very difficult for because COVID is so contagious, it's very easy for the whole um, for the whole family, if you're not isolating, for everybody to get sick at once. And then especially if you have older persons in the family with comorbidities, then if you're not isolating yourself, you are actually putting them at risk and they could get COVID from you. You might have an asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic case. They might end up on the ventilator and dying. So you have to be conscious of that, especially when you're living in a family with multi multiple generations where you have older persons and younger persons living in the same household. All right. With that said, we're going to go uh, to our last break. And when we come back, it'll just be for our final words. Don't go anywhere. Get the facts. Wraps up after these messages. As police officers, we are expected to continue to carry out our duties, trying our best to uphold and also to enforce the health regulations. The police department has an important role in the overall fight against this pandemic. We have been affected greatly as frontline workers, but now we have a vaccine to help us move forward as a country. I believe in a COVID-19 vaccine. I will take the vaccine when it's my turn. I urge you to take it too. Hashtag get vaccinated Belize. It is my time to protect your life. Don't wait to vaccinate. I believe in the COVID-19 vaccine. Do not hesitate, Belize. Vaccinate. Be COVID-19 safe. The vaccine is the best way to protect lives. Don't wait. Vaccinate. If you care, love them. Protect them. Vaccinate them. At Belmopan Medical Center, your health matters. Come see one of our many specialists, such as pediatrician, dermatologist, urologist, nephrologist, or orthopedic surgeon. Our allied services include laboratory, pharmacy, nutritionist, psychologist, hospitalization, and operating theater. We provide on-call ultrasound services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, using our new venous and arterial Doppler. Get your Abbott ID Now PCR test for only $275, or get a rapid antigen test for only $100. Both tests give results in 30 minutes. Belmopan Medical Center, located on Garbot Creek Street in Belmopan. Give us a call at 822-3179, because your health matters. As Belize continues to shield its people from the worst ravages of this pandemic, we must continue to keep our country safe by ensuring reliable supply chains for critical components for the fight ahead. 
Belize's oxygen supply is safe with 300% more oxygen supply in country than is necessary. However, Fabregas continues to make our oxygen supply chain even more robust and responsive to a potential worst-case scenario. Through supply arrangements established and secured by Fabregas, our country can receive critical life-saving oxygen from five regional neighbors in Mexico and Central America through marine and or land transportation. So, in addition, Fabregas has secured additional reliable sources of life-saving oxygen using a diversity of transportation modes and countries of origin. Fabregas, Belize Limited. We got your back. Belize Diagnostic Center, we offer FDA-approved PCR testing for COVID-19. Get your results as quickly as one hour. Don't risk getting exposed to COVID-19 by going elsewhere. We take appointments or we can come to your home or office using our concierge service with no additional fees. We have 10 locations countrywide. Call or WhatsApp us at 613-TEST. That is 613-8378 to schedule your test today. And welcome back. We're in the final segment of Get the Facts for today, August 13. Uh, Dr. Friesen, final words. Of course, I have to go back to the Verveen question for a definitive answer. What's the challenge there and your experience? Well, like I was saying earlier, with, um, with natural remedies that you are not very accustomed to, sometimes people go a little bit overboard and they can run into some side effects. Um, for example, the Verveen, if taken in large amounts, it can actually cause diarrhea. And we have seen it in the clinic, at the clinic level. And so it's just important when we are doing natural remedies at home to do things in moderation and to use um, remedies that you have used before um, or that are common, commonly used um, around you and in your family, right? So that, that's just my advice in as far as that. Chamomile is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> and honey, we were talking about honey as well. Yes. The honey, challenge with honey. The challenge with honey is um, that it should not be given to kids under one year old because it can cause um, life-threatening infections. And so honey is safe to use only from one year and above. And so don't give any babies or um, small children honey um, for a cough and cold. They, would, they could get Lyme, but they couldn't get the honey. Okay. Very good point. Any final words um, in terms of care? Uh, so just in summary, um, get, a, get a checkup, get a diagnosis. If you have comorbidities, get them under control. Um, three main points with a home care is hydrate well. Make sure that you're drinking lots of water, lots of warm tea, Pedialyte, coconut water. If you're starting with vomiting and diarrhea, you need to start, you know, um, hydrating well. Um, to rest, you need to rest. No strenuous labor, no going out into the sun. Make sure you rest. Move around your room, but still don't do anything heavy or any strenuous labor. Um, and then nutrition, proper diet, um, making sure you're eating nutritious food, no junk food, um, no food that's hard to digest, and then your anxiety management. And if you have any warning signs, then please come and get an evaluation by a doctor so that we don't have to end up with so many complications later on. Get an evaluation if you're concerned. And that, I think, are my final words. All right. And with that, we've come to the end of our show for tonight. Of course, we'd like to thank our viewers for tuning in. And here is the vaccination schedule for this week. So uh, we don't have it. Um, but remember, there are opportunities for you to uh, plug in to what the schedules are for our 12 to 17 year olds and also in general. It's now open um, widely for everyone to access it if you're above the age of 12, and that is key. Stay safe and tune in next week for another show of Get the Facts, brought to you by the Ministry of Health and Wellness and this station, Channel 5. Until next week, we continue to ask you to honor the three W's. 
wash your hands, wear your mask, and watch your physical distance. Until next week, do take care and be sure to join us again. Good night, I'm William Leo.